be quiet. Don't go, go far. He got arrested by cocaine. And he came up and said, I have an addiction. I have a sickness. He pleaded for mercy from the court, and he got it. And he got drug treatment through his state-funded health care. Let one of y'all get some cocaine. Did you get what I'm saying? So we have an ethic of treatment and care and love and investment for people who are rich. But for everyday people, we criminalize. We criminalize addiction. We criminalize mental health. We criminalize poverty. By criminalizing all that stuff, we end up with a state that is criminalized. And we as a people have bought into this logic that the way to get justice is through punishment. And the way to get punishment is by confinement. The way to get confinement is through prison. So we bought into this logic of, of containment and blame rather than investment and love. And it has happened nowhere more than with our children. We are afraid of them. And so we criminalize their fashion. There's at least 15 cities in this country that have anti-baggy pants legislation right now on the books. We've criminalized their fashion. You go to a place like Philly, and I'm, I'm on this side, but I'm from North Philly, and we had curfew. And the curfews have gotten more stringent. In the summertime in some of these cities, it's as early as 9 o'clock for 17-year-old, 16-year-old. So when you add juvenile curfews, stop and frisk, anti-loitering, civil injunction against gangs, you have literally made it illegal to be young and black and outside. <laughs> and then, last minute, you look at these schools, which are broken, and you look at where we've invested our resources, you look at where we've invested our money and our attention, it's all on the containment side. Because, you know, you go to school, uh, you go to the old Bratz, you go to the old Gillespie, you go to the old Fitzsimons, you go to Beaver, you go to the, the S school, Shaw, uh, uh, Shoemaker, um, Sam, you go to any of them schools, we'll go on one of them. It's a line down the street to get in. And it's not just in Philly, it's in Box, it's in Harlem, it's in Brooklyn, it's in the Third Ward, it's in the Fifth Ward, it's in the Ninth Ward, depending on what city you're in. So every one of the King Jr. Boulevard in the country, you go to any of these schools and you see a line down the street to get in because we've invested all of our money on criminalizing their bodies from the age of four. So you walk into school and there's a surveillance camera looking at you. We spent more money on surveillance equipment in schools than prisons in the last seven years. There's a metal detector. There's a dog sniffing through your legs. There's a locker search. There's a book bag search. There's a fingerprint scan. There's a police officer, a parole officer, a probation officer, a school officer. It takes you 20 minutes to get into school because you've been searched and prodded and criminalized so much. And after the 20 minutes of getting into school, once you get in, there's nobody stopping you from leaving. <laughs> Think about it. Every day, our phone, as much as the charge, rings off the hook. 
mother, mothers, grandmothers, aunts, and sisters, dads who have to bury their children because of senseless violence. Uh, we have something here. We get a sheet each week from the homicide department that gives us the names of the victims and the families that have been lost to violence. But right here I have a sheet. It's called a homicide victim by age, race, and sex. And I know you can't see it from where you're sitting, but I'm going to give you an idea of what it says. The total number of homicides from January 1st to November 1st this year is 211 murders. That's the total. And then it breaks it down by race. So of that 211, 33 were white males and 154 were black males. Wow. Something real wrong with that. Right, right. I go around the city, actually I go around the country because Mothers in Charge is now a national organization. <laughs> chapters throughout the country. And you applaud and I thank you for that, but actually we're an organization that wants to be out of business. Right. We don't want mothers to continue to come to us because they have to bury their children. While we provide an invaluable service to them in terms of grief support and supporting families who've been affected by violence, we don't want to continue to have to do that. There needs to be some outrage about what has happened. I recently gave a testimony, uh, testified at uh, State Representative Ron Waters on violence being a public health issue. It's the leading cause of death among African American males 14 to 24. That's a health issue. That's a national health issue. But yet there's no outrage about it. It's a pain that I live with every single day. I want to show you this. Colleague DeBar Johnson, this is a graduation picture from the University of Mount Eastern Shore. He was 24 years old, and he was shot seven times over parking space. I live with that pain still, although it's been several years, it feels like sometimes it was yesterday. I want to show you the criminal history record of the person who murdered Ali. This started at age 16, and it's 10 pages long. All sorts of charges, from simple assault, to resistant arrest, to finally two murder charges at the age of 26. He murdered my son, he murdered Ali, he murdered Justin Donald. So in July of 2001, Justin was murdered, and in December of 2001, my son was murdered. I currently sit on the prison board for the last, since 2008, we were appointed by Mayor Nutter. So we see a lot of what is happening with the whole mass incarceration. We're very concerned about that. But we've got to do things differently than we're doing. So differently. Chad and I are working every day with the Philadelphia prison to find ways that we can do things differently so that folks that are incarcerated come home differently. I believe that if Ernest Odom, at the age of 16, when he started going into the criminal justice system, until the age of 26 when he killed these two young men, my son and, and Justin, if there had been something in place, maybe during that time, my children would still be alive. But they incarcerate, but there's no rehabilitation. There's nothing that happens, but that is what Chad and I are working every single day to find ways that we can bring programs to the Philadelphia prison system to help young men that end up there. Because oftentimes they don't have the tools to do anything different than what they do. They were brought up in violent homes. That's all they saw. They know nothing about conflict resolution. The only thing they know when they're in a conflict is to be aggressive, act violent, and shoot somebody. They have to be taught tools and given opportunities to know something different from what they may have experienced. So we do programs on the, on the Philadelphia prison around thinking for change, a cognitive skills-based program where we're teaching men that are incarcerated different ways of thinking, believing that if we can change the way they think, we change their behavior. I truly believe that had Ernest Odom, while he was in and out of jail all of his life, had had something while he was incarcerated, maybe he would have came home differently, got connected with some support systems that would have helped him to be a productive citizen, and my son would still be alive. So it's important that we get involved in many aspects. 
But the thing I think that bothers me most is that there is really no outrage about the children that are dying every single day. And someone mentioned it earlier. You know, I know there's some churches, and I thank you, Pastor, for allowing us to be here. And I know there's some churches that are doing wonderful things in our community. But it's not like it was when Martin Luther King was, you know, that whole social justice in the, in the, in the, in the faith race community was there, making things happen in our community, changing things that were, that were, inju that were injustices and things that weren't right. I don't see that same kind of involvement with our churches today. You know, I, I, I would love to see more churches, as Chad said, open their doors to teach black education and, and, and African American studies to our children. You know, being a, a safe place where children can come and, and get tutored and, and, and learn character, you know? I mean, there's things that we all can do and then, then the community could get involved to do these things. You don't want to wait until something happens. I, I'm just asking you tonight, as you, as you leave here, to think about what is said and what you've heard, but think about what you as a person can do to make a difference to save a life. Because I believe there's something that each and every one of us can do to save a life. Yeah. 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 Yeah.